I like that picture because I think it kind of represents uh, what we need in our culture today. Almost just like friends hanging on to each other through what's, you know, who knows what's ahead, but just a time to kind of maybe stop and reflect. So let me just give you kind of a couple goals of, of my intent or my vision of e even doing this. First of all, I'm hoping that any information is, is useful and it'll help you grow um, and maximize your God-given gifts and talents that we all have. Uh, the other thing is just maybe to provide an encouraging environment, obviously to honor God in everything that we do. Um, have a little bit of fun in the, in the meantime and be with some friends and, and family. Also, it's something where in the future, the plan is to maybe do this every first Friday of the month. So if you uh, want to invite some family or some friends, it's geared towards young people, but the things that I'm going to share tonight, they've pumped me up because all of us um, can, can use truth from the Word of God. So. My goal tonight and just in my ministry is also, I kind of want to um, create a sense of urgency and maybe light a fire under you and realize, hey guys, this world is not our home. And um, we're living, you know, God's not surprised about what's going on. He knew exactly the generation that you guys were going to be born in. And it's, it could be anxious, but think about this, how exciting to maybe be one of the last generations on earth standing for truth. And that just, that excites me. You know, they say that only about four or five percent of the generation Z, which makes up about 70 million people, have a biblical worldview. Think about that. Four percent have a biblical worldview. That means 96 percent of your peers don't think this is the inspired Word of God. I look at that as an amazing opportunity, right? Because your light should shine even brighter in a, in a dark culture. And I believe that God really wants to use you. But think about this, and there's not a wrong answer, and you can, this could be interactive here. What do you feel is under attack today in our society, in our culture? Anything come to mind? Families. Families? <laughs> right. You have so many things. I mean, I put a slide up here. This is an exhaustive list, but think about this. The family was the first thing that came to mind. The family, fathers, traditional marriage between a man and a woman. The Bible has always been under attack. Um, Christianity, just moral values have, have just decayed. Um, truth itself. That's why I'm so... <laughs> yeah, truth is relevant nowadays. Whatever, you know, if that's true for you then that's your truth. There's no objective standard anymore in this culture. You know, all the way back in Isaiah, the prophet wrote this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, but put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Think about that. That's the culture that we live in. Anything that you stand for that's wholesome and true and conservative and godly and Christian is being turned upside down right now. So, not to scare you, to excite you, to realize, hey, we are in a battle. And um, what an awesome opportunity to serve Jesus Christ, I believe. As a father, I kind of have this papa bear mentality. This is kind of how I feel like Satan in the world's looking at me right now. I know it's kind of a, a scary thought, but I feel like my family is in the crosshairs, you know. Um, and I was listening to uh, Charlie Kirk last night. Uh, my wife was there and some of you were there. But I was listening to here, and as I was preparing some of these thoughts for tonight, I heard him make this comment. Is your Christianity like a cruise ship or a battleship? I'm like, wow, i got to make a slide for that. So I'm sitting here listening. I made this slide. Think about that. Most of us are being desensitized to the culture, and we're just on vacation. We just want to live it up. Nothing's wrong with vacation. I love vacation. But Christians, we are in a battleship. We are in a war. And uh, we're told, the Apostle Paul told uh, a younger minister, Timothy, this he said you must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of jesus christ no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier i think we should get involved i think we should get engaged in our communities in our school in voting do what we can but we need to remember the world isn't going to get better if you read the bible timothy says in the last time what's going to happen perilous times will come. We'll see that. That doesn't mean we need to give up, but if we have this vision that one day it's all going to be right, man, it helps us in the moment, doesn't it? I like to think of, uh, 
as an ambassador. Does anybody know what an ambassador is? Or just a, a brief definition? Yeah, it's a representative. Basically, it's a, a respected official acting as a representative of a nation sent to a foreign land. And the ambassador's role is to reflect the official position of the sovereign body that gave him authority. Think about it. In Philippians 3, we're told this. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are here just as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. What an awesome message we have that, you know, we're not the source of truth. But think about this. Electricity runs through conduit. We're just the conduit. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Sometimes like you're tired from work. You've had a long day. I remember this one prior to COVID. We used to go to Redlands Market. I remember that. We set up a booth. I remember because I'd bring all the stuff. I'm like, man, I'm too tired. I don't want to go to market. I've been working. All I'd set it up and the first conversation hits and you start and you're just pumped with adrenaline. It's like I feel like I'm that conduit channeling that source. And it's so exciting just to and see Satan wants us to get out of God's word. He doesn't he knows the power of the word of God. The departure from truth, I think, is starting even earlier in our culture, probably because of the technology we have. But I want to give you, and I know some of you have already been in college. Maybe some aren't going to go to college. You can start our own business. But this is true to our culture. But let me give you just a little reality check that's going in our college campuses today, okay? Think about this. <clears throat> and these are the authorities that are supposed to be teaching the youth of our culture. First of all, professors are five times more likely to be atheists than the general public. So think about this. If you're not grounded in the Word of God and you're not being equipped as a young person and the first time you have any contradiction to Christianity is in, in college from an authority, you're toast. You know, you, if you don't know what you believe and why you believe it, your faith is going to crumble. That's why it's so critical. I see a lot of men out here, Lord willing, you're going to be fathers. Teach your children when they're young. You know, so when they get into the college, you know, Nikki had an experience like this. It was, it was exciting where her college professor was talking about gender identity and it didn't rock her world because she had heard that before. And uh, that's what I want for all of you guys, just to be equipped, as the scripture says. So that's the, kind of our professors. Only 6% of professors say that the Bible is the word of God. That means 94% say the Bible is not the word of God. More than half of professors have unfavorable feelings towards evangelical Christians, and about two-thirds describe themselves as liberal or very liberal. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of quotes from some liberal professors, and this isn't extreme. This is, this is their intent. This is the majority of the culture out there against Christianity. Listen to this quote from Daniel Dennett. They will see me just as another liberal professor, trying to cajole them out of their, some of their convictions, and they are dead right. He's not ashamed of it. They're dead right about that. That's, that's what I am, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. He's trying to knock you out of your Christian convictions. You're going to love the eyebrows on this guy. <laughs> Mr. Richard Rory, listen to what he says. We try to arrange things so that students who enter... This is what the view of Christianity is. If you hold biblical Christian worldview... You are bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists, and they're going to leave college with views more like our own. Now, listen, parents, this should like rile you up. You talk about Papa Bear. This next statement is to, to me and to you. So we're going to go right on trying to discredit you, me, in the eyes of your children, trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. That's where we're sending our kids, guys. But we don't have to be afraid. We, we don't if we equip them. But that's the culture out there. And I think it's going to get worse and worse, not better. What are we told in Timothy? God has not given us a spirit of what? Yeah. Fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. So what an awesome opportunity to be bold for Christ. Anybody know what this is? 600 BC, back in Babylon, now it's Iraq. But think about this. If you remember the context, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he got proud and he built this image almost 100 feet tall. Scripture says this was 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide. And remember, whenever the music played, what did everybody have to do? Bow down to this image. Well, you notice three guys there. Look at everyone around is bowing down. Man, is this a picture of our culture or what? There's a time where we don't have to bow down and we answer to God, not to man. 
But think about this and the boldness. If you realize their life was at stake because if you didn't bow down, what was going to happen? You're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace and basically just be melted. They knew this. And look at these guys. They're just standing. And when they are questioned, this is what they say. We don't need to answer you in this matter. Can you imagine saying that to the king who had the power to kill you? We don't, we don't answer to you. And then they go on to say, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, look at this vision. Even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. That's what I want to be. That's what I want you guys to be. Be bold and be able to stand for truth. And if you remember the account, man, King Nebuchadnezzar got furious. Remember, he, he got so angry. What did he do to the furnace? He heated it up like seven times more, right? So hot that even the guards were killed instantly. They throw them in there. If you read the context, it doesn't even singe them. It doesn't, they're, they're walking around and all of a sudden they're looking and say, wait a minute, there's, there's like four people in there. And the other one was the son of God. God was with them in the flame. And I love that picture. No matter what flame we're in, guys, God is with us in the flame. If we die to be absent, and the Apostle Paul said he was struggling. He's like, to depart and be with Christ is far better, but to stay is needful for you. We win either way. If we go out, we're with the Lord. But every one of you are here. So I think God has a reason for you to be here and to be a shining light in this last uh, culture here. So what can we do? Um, this isn't gloom and doom. This is going to be a message of hope. So we may not be able to change the world, but what can we do? What's something that, who can you control? Yourself. Yourself. Absolutely. I can't control, I can't control my family, my kids, but I can influence them and they can look at me and say, you know what? I may not believe the God that James believes that man, he's excited and zealous about. There's something about that. And I think if enough Christians were on fire for the Lord, that would be a united testimony to the world. Jesus Christ himself said this, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Think about Solomon. Here's a guy that had everything. If you read the context, the wealth in his day, I mean, he had ships going and bringing gold and monkeys and this and that. And just, he had everything, servants. And, and then what did he say? Um, Unless the Lord build a house. They labor in vain that build it. It's all grasping for the wind. I'll never attain what Solomon did, but even if I could, it's all vanity if the Lord isn't in it. And so I know most of you here, and you probably wouldn't be here if you were a believer, but I never want to take it for granted. The most important thing you can do, I believe, is first of all, answer the call of, of Joshua. Choose who you're going to serve. But first of all, you have to be born again. And we know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. But we're told in Romans 3 that what? All have sinned. If we're honest with ourselves, we know we've all fallen short. You know, that's one of the reasons that the law was given to shut their mouths. They couldn't do it. And Romans 6 says the wages or the payment of sin is death. If the verse stopped there, we're sunk, right? Because the Bible says that even if you look at a woman to lust, you're guilty of adultery in your heart, right? Um, we have all sinned and God demands perfection. Think about this. To get to heaven, you'd be perfect, but we've all sinned. So we're never going to make it. So the only substitute was Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life. He took the penalty for the crimes that we punished. His righteousness is put to our credit. And it's not important so much the words as the heart's attitude, but I hope everyone in this room and everyone that maybe is listening to this video down the road has called on the Lord Jesus Christ and repented and turned around. And once you've made that choice, then he'll help you make some other good choices that we're gonna talk about right now. So what are some things for the next few minutes, we're gonna just talk about the importance of choices. So you guys with me? All right, think about this. Every single, everything in your life is a reflection of every choice you've made. If you want a different result, make a different choice. You guys heard the definition of stupidity? doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Think about that. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but you are an accumulation of a lifetime of choices that you've made in your life. Think about this. Every choice we make has consequences. Some of them are life and death. Some may seem minor. 
Our repeated choices become our habits. Our habits become who we are. We are what we repeatedly do. Think about that every single day. I want to paint a picture for you, and this actually comes out of a book, um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Uh, Anthony, I think you're in the middle of reading that. I just gave that to you. Isn't that an awesome book? If you want a good book, look that up, Atomic Habits. But he starts out early in the book, and you, you can do this mental exercise right now. He, he says, imagine two versions of yourself five years in the future. So think about yourself where you want to be in five years. And then he says, um, what would life be like if you continued to repeat your bad habits every single day? What would life look like in five years if you stuck to good habits every day? You know, we know like if I went to work out today and I had a really good workout, you know, just hard workout and then I'm done. Okay, you're not going to transform your body with one workout, right? It's got to be consistent, consistent over time and then you can build your body. The same, conversely, let's say I have a bad day at work and I'm really busy and I come home and I'm not as nice to my wife as I should be. I spend no time with my kids. That's not going to define their whole existence, right? One thing. But over five years, think about the power of choices in every single day life. It's easy to see how habits add up to something extremely important. Here's a quote out of that book here. The habits you repeat or don't repeat every day largely determines your health, wealth, and happiness. Knowing how to change your habits means knowing how to confidently own and manage your days. Focus on the behaviors that have the highest impact. That is so important. And then reverse engineer the life that you want. 50,000, you're probably going, what in the heck does that mean? That's the amount of thoughts that you have every single day that come through your mind. I showed this to Derek last night, and he goes, oh, I think mine's more like 250,000. He's, prob <laughs> He's probably right. <laughs> but what does Scripture say? As a man thinking in his heart, so is he. Your thoughts become who you are. That's why it's so critical what we're dwelling on, what we're feeding on. We're told this, <clears throat> casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You know, sometimes you, it's almost like saying, don't look at that square or don't. It's not like you can't think of it, but I like to apply um, Philippians 4, 8. It's replace the thought with another thought. You know, Philippians 4 says, meditate on these things. And I guarantee you, everyone in this room knows some things that are true, some things that are pure, just, lovely, of a good report. If there's anything of virtue, anything that's praiseworthy, we're told to meditate on these things. It's so powerful what we think about. Because sometimes you can't control that thought that comes into your mind, right? It came, it's there, but what do you do with it? You replace it and you go to Scripture. And that can become really a mindset uh, and can change your life. So what I'm going to do for the next five minutes or so um, is just quickly go through 10 points, okay? A guide to making right choices. And um, if you want a copy of this later, I'm going to give you my phone number. I can text the PowerPoint message to you. Um, but anyway, this has been helpful to me and to my kids. I've talked to them about this. When you're making decisions in life, run through these 10 things. It's not an exhaustive list, but number one, I think, has to be on the top of the list, is in Proverbs 1, fear the Lord. And you know, the Bible uses the term fear at least 300 times in Scripture as it refers to God. Not that we're to be scared of God. There's an awesome respect and a reverence, but I also think it's more than that. I think it is a fear at times <clears throat> of sin. When you disobey God, there is judgment. You know, God is a God of love. He's also a righteous judge. And we need to have an awesome reverence and respect. And I think that's the foundation of making good choices, to fear God in your life. Um, number two is to know your priorities. What's really, really important? I think this is so critical. As, as I talk to young men, a lot of times people get so pumped up and they're ready to go conquer the world. Because I'm a firm believer, if you set your mind to do something, you can almost do anything you want. So let's make sure that what you're going to go after is a worthy goal. You've heard the term, you know, climb the ladder of success and realize maybe it's against the wrong wall. I think that's why scripture says over and over, ponder the path of your feet. 
let all your ways be established. Every year I try to set time out, especially at the end of the year, and I do it every month and I look at my goals and I set back and it's like, is this a worthwhile goal? Because you only have so much time in life. What am I going to go after? Um, and that's so scripture. Um, I think there's a book, some of you might know it, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Um, the second point there is begin with the end in mind. I think it's so important for a Christian, first of all, just to acknowledge what would God want me to do and then go for it instead of just jumping in it. So spend time, get to know your priorities. Number three, will my parents or my mentors or authority figures approve? Are you seeking counsel? This is just my personal opinion. It, it may not be right, but it's, it served me well. Don't have too many, too, don't have too many counselors in your life. Have a few people that you really, really respect. Maybe it's in the financial area. You might look at someone like Mike who's been successful, or maybe it's someone raising kids, or maybe it's you have a handful of people that you've seen that have some years of experience and that love you, and they're going to be faithful to you, and they may tell you some hard things, but they're not going to spread your reputation out there. So have a handful of, of mentors in your life. Anybody know what the term or the definition of a mentor is? Um, Think about this. A mentor is someone you give permission to be an authority in your life. You're the one that choose that, chose that mentor. I've got mentors in my life, and they're so valuable, and I don't want a bunch of yes men around me. I want people to look at me and say, James, no, that's a dumb idea. Or, hey, you have some talent. Go after this. But we need to have mentors in your life. So when you're making decisions, if you know people that really love you and, re and you have respect for them, have really red flags, then you, you better pause. And don't just go charging ahead, but have mentors in your life. Will it cause others to stumble? Think about that. It's not loving to contribute to someone's weakness. Um, I don't drink, but I think in Scripture there's, there's biblical, uh, it's okay in moderation. But let's say I knew Mike was a, a huge alcoholic, had a major problem with drinking, and I invited him for dinner, and I pull out the beer and wine. Would that be a loving thing to do if I had liberty to do that? I think that's what that, that verse is saying. I don't want to be a stumbling block. So think about in your decision process, is it going to cause a brother or sister, sister to stumble? Will it be habit forming? This could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. We want good, good habits. Will it edify, which is the opposite of causing someone to stumble? I don't know if you ever thought about this, but edify comes the word, from the word edifice. And an edifice is something like a, a structure or a rock or a building, something that, that protrudes up. You know, if, you're, if you're mountain climbing, you want to make it to this edifice. So think about that. The word edify, I want to build you up, Dean. I don't want to tear you down. So I want to hang around people or make decisions that's going to that's gonna build me up and not tear me down. Will it be a good testimony to the world? We're told in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should be salt and light in this world and a testimony to the Lord. Of course, we always want to pray. Um, Philippians 4 is one of my favorite patches. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then that's where the peace, the pass of all understanding comes in. What I think is amazing about that passage, it doesn't say if your prayer is answered that you're going to have the peace. You just lay your burden to the Lord. It's like talking to a dad or a parent, someone you love. Just you drop your burden. You let your request be made known. And then that's when the peace comes in. And just let him take the burden. You probably all know this verse, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, something you learn as a little kid. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways. All your ways, even the little things. Acknowledge Him, and He's promised to direct your path. Of course, does it violate a principle in God's Word? And to know that, you've got to be in God's Word. How can a young man or a young woman cleanse his or her way? By taking heed according to your Word. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Young people, the best advice I could ever probably give you is, what the Apostle Paul said in Acts, I commend you to God and His Word, which is able to build you up. Um, the first verse I think my dad ever taught me, he used to, he worked for the county of Riverside, and he would write Bible verses to Jeff and I on the back of his business card. <laughs> and the first verse I ever memorized was Proverbs 30, verse 5. <clears throat> Every word of God is pure. 
He's a shield to those who put their trust in him. Um, God's word is just awesome. And then lastly, will it glorify God? 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So I'll just close with this last slide. I don't know if you remember where this comes from. Is there not a cause? Does that ring a bell to you in Scripture? Remember David, little shepherd boy? Let me just paint the story. Think about this. Here's David being obedient to his father, taking care of sheep while his brothers go off to the war where they're fighting the Philistines. And one day Jesse comes out and tells David, I want you to go down to the battle, bring this basket of food to your brothers, and also give me a report. So he, think about this. He's being obedient to his father, and he's going to take abuse for that. He gets down to the battle, and the Philistines are in the Valley of Eli, I think it says. All this stuff's going on. And you remember, Goliath would come out every day and challenge you know, the Israelites for a fight. And they were what? Terrified. And pretty soon, David, he's just the shepherd boy. He's like, He's right with the Lord. He's like, what is going on here? We serve a God who's, who's mighty and powerful. And his own brother, Eliab, the oldest brother, is like, David, I know why you came down here. I know the naughtiest of your heart. You just came down here to see what's going on. Think about that. Some of the biggest hurts can come from your own family, right? He's being obedient to his father, and he's being convicted that this Philistine giant is defying the armies of the living God. He's like, wait a minute, we serve an amazing, mighty God. And pretty soon, I believe this shepherd boy rebukes the whole camp. Word gets around, he goes to King Saul. And King Saul, think about this, it says King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. If anybody should have fought Goliath, he was in leadership, he should have led by example. Everybody was afraid. Here David is just rebuking people because his eyes were where they needed to be. So finally King Saul, okay, you can fight him, you know, here's Here's my armor. That wasn't the way David fight, you know. I remember when I was taking care of my sheep, you know, a bear came or a lion came. So you know the story. David kills the Goliath. But before that, when all this is going on, David just makes this frame. Is there not a cause? And that's where I think right now in our culture, Christians, for you, the resounding answer should be yes. There is a cause. The Satan is trying to lull us to sleep and quiet Christian, we should be standing up saying, listen, we serve an amazing God and he'll never leave us or forsake us. And we got this, you know, no matter what. Think about, I always like to think about Romans or Revelation 21, our future. No more death, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness. That's our future. And so if that's our future, I've said this a lot of times, when I know I'm going on vacation, let's say I'm going to Hawaii, you just went to Cabo, Mike, what happens the week before when you know you got a vacation? Aren't you excited? You're looking forward. You, you don't get really down in the dumps. You're like doing your work because you want to get out of here. Not that heaven's a vacation, but you know the analogy? I think we should think about Revelation 21 all the time. That's our future. And no matter what happens in this life, how bad it is, God's word said our, even if you live 90 or 100 years, it's a vapor that short. If you had 100 years of horrible living, but you have eternity, is that worth it? You know, we, there is a cause and we should stand. So my last question to you would be, what are you gonna choose to do? And you know, the, the fact that you're here, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but when I go over these truths and God's word, it pumps me up again. It just kind of refocuses, gives me perspective of why I'm here. So I hope that does to you and you, maybe you're just more, more motivated Maybe with what's going on in the news and the culture can get you desensitized. Don't let that happen. You know, that's exactly what Satan wants. So if you want a copy of this, um, text me. That's my cell phone. I'll send you the PowerPoint. And then a lot of these are going to be put on my YouTube channel too. And kind of a shameless plug, if you're not following my YouTube channel, you need to, okay? <laughs> so subscribe. Subscribe.